Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you this morning. I appreciate this congregation. I appreciate its shepherds inviting me to come and to speak with you this morning about the work that's taking place in Athens, Georgia. I really appreciate the fact that the church here not only helps to support me, but also is interested in having the men they support in to speak to the congregation. And I've been in situations on both ends of this, working with a congregation that's supporting men in other places and having them in to speak, but I've also been on the other side of it where you're one of those guys that's being supported and recognizing how important that relationship is and what a wonderful blessing it is to to put names with the faces and faces with the names and to be able to, to actually visit with the brethren who are having fellowship with you in the work that you're doing. So I appreciate this congregation, but not only for that reason, I've had an appreciation for the church here for many years, going back to the time that I spent preaching up in Canada, in Toronto, and working with my good friend and fellow laborer, Chuck Bartlett. And Chuck was supported by the church here, and not only financially supported by the church here at that time, but the church here was very good about coming up and encouraging us and helping us and assisting us. And it's so good this morning to see Bill and Pat Gravitt again, David Knoll, the ones who came up and encouraged us and helped us in the work that we did up there for several years. And so I've had a, a long appreciation for the group here, even though this is the first time that I've ever actually been here. And so it is good to finally be here with you in person. Let me begin by simply stating that we live in a world that is openly rebellious toward God. In 1 John chapter 5, the Apostle John pointed out the contrast between faithful Christians and the rest of the inhabitants of the world in this way. And I'm reading from the New King James Version this morning, but notice 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, the Apostle John says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The influence of the wicked one is very easily seen in our society today as people are filled with selfishness, filled with greed. People are acting out of rebellion against God and acting out their rebellion against the God of heaven by engaging in sexual immorality, by engaging in the abuse of alcohol and drugs, through abortion and other forms of of murder, along along with engaging in false religion, religion that glorifies man and his desires rather than glorifying the Creator and His will. And in recent years, we have witnessed mankind rising up in defiance to fight against the decrees of the God of heaven concerning marriage, concerning sexuality, and even concerning the concept of gender itself, where now we've reached a point in our society and its defiance against God where you can't even answer the question, what is a woman? The great tragedy of all of this, of course, is that those who fight against God will suffer an ultimate, irreversible defeat. The Apostle Paul makes this clear to us, doesn't he, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Paul assures us of this, saying, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. But sadly, 
sinful rebellion against God with the terrible consequences that it brings will continue to be the way of life for most in this world until that day comes. That's the bad news. But at the same time, there's good news. God wants every person in the world to be saved. Now, although man continues to rebel against his Creator, the Bible assures us that our loving God wants us to come to Him. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verses 3 and 4, as Paul talks about the ones for whom we should pray, he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is what God wants for all of us. Do you realize that He continues to allow life on earth to proceed in order to provide more time for sinners to turn from their sinful ways and to come to Him? In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, Peter makes that very point, doesn't he? Concerning the second coming of Christ, Peter says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness. But notice, is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God wants out of this world. And so the world continues to turn as His long-suffering allows a little bit more time for sinners to come to repentance. No, He will not save anyone in their sins, but He is ready and willing to save those who will come out of their sins and come to Him on His terms. God wants every sinner to be saved And salvation is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel saves sinners. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, when the woman was deceived and partook of the forbidden fruit and gave it to her husband and they transgressed the law of God, God spoke to the serpent on that occasion. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The seed of the woman would be Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The one who would be born of a woman and who would deliver that crushing blow to the serpent's head and his sinister schemes would be defeated. The entire Old Testament points forward to His coming with prophecy after prophecy foretelling His arrival, prophecy after prophecy providing the assurance of the salvation that He would come into the world to accomplish. And when He finally did enter the world, John the baptizer rightly identified Him as that promised one. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, as Jesus arrived on the scene, we read the next day John saw Jesus coming toward Him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's who He is. The Lamb of God. The one who laid down His life at the cross in order to serve as the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice capable of dealing with our greatest problem, capable of taking away our sin. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul summarizes that saying, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
after Jesus victoriously conquered death through His resurrection, He sent His apostles out into the world. As we come to the end of Matthew's Gospel in Matthew 28 and verses 19 and 20, we read that the Savior said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. God's plan was fulfilled. The devil's grip was loosened. And the offer of salvation was extended from that time forward to all who will believe and obey the gospel of Christ. Yes, sinners must not only believe, but obey the gospel in order to be saved. But you know, in order for the gospel of Christ to have any impact on the world, what has to happen? It has to spread. It has to be proclaimed. It has to be heard. It has to reach the ears and the minds and the hearts of individuals so that they can respond to its terms. In Romans chapter 1, in verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. People become disciples of Christ when they believe and obey the gospel. That's how you become a Christian. When people turn from their sins and confess their faith in the Son of God and are baptized into Christ, for the remission of sins. That's how disciples of Christ are made. That's how people are saved. As Peter announced to the crowd on Pentecost in Acts 2 and verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everyone needs this message. Everyone needs to hear the gospel because the gospel is the only solution to the problem of sin. But something else I'd like for us to consider is that the saved need to be made aware of the progress of the gospel in other places. Paul and Barnabas, as we read in the book of Acts, departed from the church in Antioch in Acts chapter 13, and they embarked upon what we commonly refer to as Paul's first preaching journey. And when they returned home to Antioch, after traveling and preaching elsewhere, Notice what the Bible says at the end of Acts chapter 14. Acts 14 and verse 27 says, Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. That's interesting, isn't it? Think about how encouraging it would have been if you were one of those members of the church in Antioch, think about how encouraging, how helpful it must have been for the brethren there in Antioch to hear about the progress of the Lord's work in these other places out here where Paul and Barnabas had been laboring on their journey. And so what we see here in Acts chapter 14 is that bringing the local church a report concerning work that is done in another place, that's something that was done with the Lord's approval back in the first century, wasn't it? And so we need to be aware of efforts that are made to spread the gospel in other places. We need to engage in this same kind of thing here in this century, today. 
We need to be aware of efforts that are made to spread the gospel, of course, locally, but also elsewhere. Why? So that we can pray for those efforts. So that in some way we can help with those efforts. So that we can be encouraged by those efforts. And so that we can contribute in some manner to those efforts. Well, with these thoughts in mind, I'd like to report to you concerning our work in the Athens, Georgia area for a few minutes. <clears throat> the work in Athens, Georgia has been historically, I would say, a difficult work. Athens is located, as you can see on the map, about 50 miles east of Atlanta and is home to the University of Georgia. <clears throat> the gospel brings people together, doesn't it? Now, here I am at Gardendale, Alabama, and if this is like most congregations in the state of Alabama, you have generally a couple of different factions within the congregation. You've got those that cry, Roll Tide, and those that cry, War Eagle. And the gospel brings us together. But I'll tell you something, it's, it's even a step beyond that that you'd have a Georgia Bulldog here in the midst of all of that. And would support one of those and encourage him in his work right in the belly of the beast in Athens, Georgia, where the university is. Once you travel east of Atlanta, it becomes clear that there are very few churches out in that direction that are holding to the New Testament pattern. Upon hearing that I was interested in helping to start a congregation in Athens, some said, why would you want to start a congregation in Athens? And you know what they were thinking of? Athens, Alabama. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Athens, Georgia is not Athens, Alabama. That's not Limestone County. There are very few churches, once you go east of Atlanta, there are very, very few churches holding to the New Testament pattern out in that direction. Jesus, in the midst of His earthly ministry, said this. Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. He said to His disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. There are many places, even, even in the southeastern United States, there are places where much more work needs to be done to spread the gospel, and the laborers are few. Now, to make matters more difficult, the main non-institutional congregation in the area was established about 50 years ago, but it is one that has constantly been beset by internal problems and difficulties and struggles through the decades. This is a church that has never even been able to reach the point of having its own elders. And I saw that situation firsthand. I attended the University of Georgia. That's the school I graduated from. And I attended that congregation when I was a student there and noticed that pattern and noticed how that pattern continued for many years even afterward. Now there's more. A happier update to that story. Just hold that thought. But in June of 2020, 
Well, I was engaged in a good work with the Hebron Lane Church of Christ up in the Louisville, Kentucky area. I was approached by some brethren who expressed an interest in wanting to start a new congregation in Athens, Georgia, thinking that it's time to move forward, it's time to move on. Some from that congregation that had been there, others from nearby who would come in from other areas, some who had recently moved from the air, moved to the area, and, and they contacted me and said, we're interested in starting a work in the Athens area. Well, I'd already experienced starting a couple of congregations up in Toronto from 1998 to 2005 and had an understanding of what it would be like to be involved in starting a new work based on that previous experience. And I always knew that there was such a great need in Athens, Georgia. So as I sat there in the Louisville, Kentucky area, I thought about this. And I could pretty easily count probably around 25 non-institutional churches of Christ that were meeting around the Louisville, Kentucky area. And I could pretty quickly recognize the difference between that and Athens, Georgia. And you can probably do the same thing, maybe here in central Alabama, maybe around the Birmingham area. Maybe as we think of Middle Tennessee, other areas where there's so many churches, Athens, Georgia wasn't like that. Compared to other college towns in the South, Athens, Georgia just isn't the same kind of thing. You think about places like Bowling Green, Kentucky, home to Western Kentucky University, or, or down in Auburn. Or out in College Station, Texas, where Texas A&M is located. You compare those situations with Athens, Georgia. Well, there is no comparison. There is no comparison. When it comes to churches, when it comes to the number of brethren, when it comes to the work that's been done. And so we proceeded with the plan. And the new congregation began meeting in August of 2020. Now, in order to engage in this work, what this would mean is that I would need to raise full financial support and move my family from Kentucky to Georgia. The church with which I was working in Kentucky would not be able to continue to fully support me. They would need to bring in another evangelist to replace me once I would leave there. And at the same time, the Lord's Church is not a denomination. There was no central office I could call up and request financial support from. Instead, as we see in the New Testament, sometimes an evangelist has to take wages from other churches in order to launch out and start working in a new location. And that can be a challenging situation. Think about, you know, you've got a family of eight, and here you're going to raise financial support, full support. You're not going to be supported by the brethren where you're going because you're starting something new. And so you've got to take wages from other churches in order to go and do this work. Well, that takes some doing in and of itself to raise that financial support. And so... I began to raise that financial support and to arrange to move my family to Georgia. Meanwhile, the brethren interested in starting this new work began meeting as the University Church of Christ in Athens in August of 2020. First meeting in a rented space in downtown Athens. I made multiple trips down from Kentucky to encourage them, to update them on my progress over the next several months until I was able to move my family down in August of 2021. The church has since met in a community center in a rented office building, and for the past two and a half years, we've been renting a space in a large commercial building where we currently meet. 
Now, while we've recently had some obey the gospel, we've also had some recently move away. And this is kind of the nature of the thing. Even the two families that were primarily instrumental in talking me into coming and doing this work are no longer with us at this point, having moved either to another area or even out of state as far as where they're worshiping now. So we typically have about 30 to 35 meeting with us on Sundays these days. Our current meeting place, this rented space that we're in, is expected to be available to us until our lease runs out in June of 2025, at which time we'll have to find most likely a new place to meet. Well, what's the plan for this work? Well, we have made a commitment to evangelize the community and to build a strong church. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy about his plan saying, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That's what the church is supposed to be. The pillar and ground of the truth. Our aim is to spread God's Word in the surrounding area where we live so that we can reach lost souls with the saving gospel of Christ. At the same time, we have a responsibility to edify the saved, to build up the members so that the church grows and is strengthened. Our desire is not just to go out and convert souls to Christ, but our desire is also to strengthen the saved so that the church can grow, can become stronger, and can reach the point where it can appoint its own qualified elders and deacons and build itself up in the faith. That's what we're trying to do. We've also made a commitment to show reverence for the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Speaking of Jesus, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, The Apostle Paul says, and He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. There would be no point in going and starting this new work if our commitment was not first and foremost to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the work in which we engage, we must submit to the authority of Christ in everything that we do. Our desire is to make sure that we honor Him, that we please Him in how we go about this work. We've made a commitment to work together as a team where strengths and talents complement one another. That's the kind of situation that Paul described when he wrote to the church of Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 15 and 16, he said, "...but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love." And so, with this in mind, we have continued to try in various ways to reach and teach the lost and also to strengthen the saved using what limited abilities and resources we have. We've got a website, uccathens.com. We post the audio of our sermon recordings on the website each week, as well as various other teaching materials that are made available. 
And we also broadcast our, our sermons and our adult Bible classes on Facebook Live where anyone can tune in and these videos are saved there and on the church's Facebook page. They can be viewed, they can be shared with others. I've produced a short evangelistic video, about three to five minutes in length, on the question, why are there so many churches? And so we printed business cards with a QR code on them. If somebody holds their phone up to that card, it'll link directly and start playing that video. And so we can hand out these cards and say, hey, look at this. Let me, let me know what you think about this. Let's talk about this. Just an easy way to, to start conversations, to get people thinking, to try and stir up some interest and set up Bible studies. Every Monday, I send a digital news bulletin for the members to know what's going on, what's been happening. Here's a link to the sermon audio from yesterday. You can listen to this. You can share this. And then also every Thursday, I send out a digital teaching bulletin, which contains a, an article on some biblical topic of study that can also not only be read by the members, but it can be passed on, it can be shared, it can be emailed or texted to others. We have engaged in multiple efforts to reach people doing door-to-door -door work, door knocking, in the areas and the neighborhoods near where the church has met, as well as trying to engage people in personal Bible studies, and talking to people downtown near the university campus, that kind of face-to-face -face work. Each week, I am engaged in personal Bible studies with individuals or sometimes small groups outside of our regular meeting times. This is something ongoing every week to try and teach the lost, try and sit down and strengthen new converts, studying with them, to try to help weaker members to grow. Every week, that's that's work that I'm engaged in. I've got a whole series when it comes to trying to, to teach people the gospel, whole series of lessons, some of these you see on the screen here, and all that's on our website. Anybody can make use of that material. But those are things that are going on all the time. And we've also tried to advertise through social media, targeted advertising to our local area, using the capabilities of Facebook to reach out those that are near where the church meets in that way. We've hosted some special series meetings which have given us the opportunity to invite people to come and hear Bible teaching on a particular topic of interest. And so we've had several of these opportunities in which we've tried to bring the community in, tried to focus on certain aspects that people might be interested in. This is one that we did last year, UFOs, aliens, and the Bible. You might think, well, what's the Bible got to do with any of that? Well, quite a bit, actually, and it's something that's on people's mind. We got a lot of feedback from the community about this one. Now, a lot of that feedback and Facebook chatter and all that didn't necessarily translate to people showing up. We did have a lot of visitors, but they were people we already knew, contacts from my kids' homeschool groups and sports and that kind of thing that did come, uh, but trying to think of ways to trigger thought, to try to trigger interest, to try to bring people in to hear the gospel. And our most recent series focused in on Christ, our hope back in June. And so we've tried to We've tried to host these opportunities. We've tried to bring people in through these various means. And in addition to this, you'll notice on this particular meeting announcement, I'm one of the speakers, but also a young man named Walker Gregory, the Oglethorpe Avenue Church of Christ. Well, that's that other congregation I mentioned earlier that's been there for a long time in Athens. 
And when I talk about problems there, I'm not telling any secrets. And the good news, the better news, is that over the past several months, we've been actively engaged in an ongoing discussion with those brethren. And we've sat down together, we've met and talked together. The problems that have existed there have gone on there, been acknowledged by all involved. And the idea is, the thought is, that what we're working toward is the possibility of merging our groups together. Coming together to work together as one, and so that would effectively double our number of members and allow us to combine our efforts in the area. And so like I said earlier, there's a happier update to some of that that I mentioned earlier. So what what are the expectations for this work? Well, it's expected that a lot of commitment is needed. Starting a new work in a situation like this is no small task. It requires serious commitment, commitment on the part of myself, my family to be fully engaged. That includes commitment on the part of my lovely wife who can no longer sit in an adult Bible class anymore because there are children's classes that have to be taught and there aren't a lot of teachers to pull from in a situation like this. It requires serious commitment on the part of the brethren with whom we're working to engage in these efforts to evangelize and to edify and to contribute to the work in various ways financially and with time and talents and ability. We don't have a large number of members and their talents to pull from. And it also requires a lot of commitment on the part of those brethren in other places who support us in this work, since I would not be able to commit myself to this work without the financial help of so many brethren in other places from whom I'm taking wages. It's expected that a lot of work will be involved. We're still very early in this process. We have plans that we haven't even been able to get to yet, to enact yet, and to carry out with regard to efforts to evangelize and to edify. We have work to do when it comes to teaching our friends and our neighbors and those connected with the university and reaching people with the truth. And we've got a lot of work to do when it comes to building up and strengthening the church. Lots of work to be done. It's also expected that there will be a lot of love for the Lord a lot of love for His Word, a lot of love for the lost and for one another. The work moves forward in a positive direction. When brethren love one another and love the Lord and work together in unity, and the expectation is that that's what we're going to do moving forward. We expect to move forward striving to be united on God's truth and its submission to His will. And it's expected that as we plant and water, God will give the increase. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 6 and 7 about the work that he and Apollos had done in spreading the gospel. He said, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor is he who waters, but God who gives the increase. As we plant and water, we expect that God will give the increase. Our role is simply to teach God's Word without fear, without compromise, as we strive to live according to His precepts. We can move forward confident that the Gospel of Christ will draw sinners to Him as we work to reach the lost and strengthen the saved. Thank you for your attention this morning. And I ask for your prayers for the work that we're doing in Athens. There is such a profound need for the work to continue to move forward to the glory of God and to the salvation of souls. And I greatly appreciate your help and your interest 
in the work in which we're engaged. It's my hope that this report has offered something to you that's both informative and encouraging. And I also hope that if you've not been faithfully serving the Lord, that you have been encouraged through the things that we've talked about this morning to start faithfully serving Him. We've been talking about a place and a situation where there is such a great need for people to hear and to obey the Gospel and to live faithfully to the Lord. But you know, that same need is present everywhere and in every place and maybe Maybe that's your need this morning. Maybe you need, out of your conviction that Jesus is the Son of God, to make that decision that you're going to serve Him today. If you have not obeyed the Gospel, why not come to Him on His terms now so that you can have the gift of eternal Life. You know, at the end of it all, there's nothing else that matters. There's nothing else that really matters. If you need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins this morning, I am very confident that that can be arranged and that can be done. If you, as a child of God, need to make correction in your life, if there's some sin from which you need to turn so that you can receive the Lord's forgiveness, Let's take care of that here and now this morning before leaving this place. If we can help you and encourage you in that way, won't you let it be known while we stand and while we sing?